good morning. Hope you're doing well. Made it through the cold. And uh, I know that some of you are concerned about me after the game yesterday. I'm okay. <laughs> I was a little depressed for a while, but I have moved on. Uh, we're thinking about next year already. So I got to get my mock draft ready to go. Uh, that's the next step for me. But hey, we are in a series. We, we launched this uh, last week. We're in the book of Acts. I'm excited. We're going to be in the book of Acts for a while, so I hope you're reading through it with us. Uh, and last week, we kicked this off, and the book of Acts is um, it's the second volume of Luke, Luke, uh, the gospel of Luke. Uh, Luke wrote Acts as kind of a part two of the story. And uh, last week, we found out that, um, that Jesus came back. This is right after the resurrection, and uh, he goes to heaven. That's kind of where we left it. Uh, he's, he ascends to heaven. Uh, all of these witnesses are, are watching him go up. And he tells them before he goes, though, to, to wait, that he's going to send uh, the, what's promised from the Father. And we know that that's the Holy Spirit. And uh, so they're, they're, they're waiting. And we find out that there was, uh, it, kind of in the rest of the story here, that uh, there's 120 people that are waiting. It's not just the disciples. It's not just a few people. It's 120 are gathered together. Uh, now, these would have been the disciples, uh, mother, uh, the, the mother of Jesus, Mary, she's there. Uh, a lot of the people who had been with him and had seen him after the resurrection had been with him in the ministry. They're all waiting. Uh, they're waiting for what is, is to be coming. And I don't know about you, but it's hard to wait, isn't it? Like, I just wrote a blog post about this because most of us struggle to wait. And I don't know about you, but most of us, we feel like we got to be doing something. And so while we're waiting, we try to figure out something to do. And I think it's really interesting as we finish chapter 1, we read about what they did. Like, they were gathered together, they were praying, but they, they got a little bit restless, I think. And because what happened was they said, hey, let's replace Judas. Remember Judas, he, he uh, you know, betrayed Jesus, and he uh, ended up committing suicide, and so he's gone. And they decide, hey, let's, let's pick some people, and uh, let's replace him. So they pick two guys. The first one, it says his name was Joseph, also called Barsabbas, also known as Justice. So he's got like three names. Very weird. The other guy is Matthias. So he, they pick these two guys. And I don't think this was really prompted by God. And I'll tell you why here in just a moment. But they cast lots to decide who is going to be these two guys. Now, that's an Old Testament way of making the decision. So basically, they're flipping a coin between these two guys. And now, that, that's the last time it ever talks about casting lots to make a decision. Uh, I believe that's because when the Holy Spirit comes, he gives us discernment. And we're called to pray and ask for wisdom and guidance when we're making decisions. Uh, who leaders should be, all of that. He guides you. Now, later in, in the book of Acts, we also discover who God picks. Now, one of the reasons, by the way, one of the reasons that I don't think this was prompted by God was because we never hear about Matthias again. Like, there's no mention of him as a disciple, uh, even that he's martyred or anything like that later on. So I think that was, that's one indication. And we also know who God picked, right? Later on in Acts, we're going to find out about Saul on the road to Damascus. Jesus picks him. And later on, his name is Paul, changes to Paul. And Paul wrote most of the New Testament. So that was God's selection. Very clear. So here's a principle before we get into chapter 2. When you're waiting on God, wait. Don't run ahead of him. It's so easy for us sometimes to become impatient and run ahead and try to figure it out and do it on our own. Sometimes we're called to do things, but pray, ask for discernment, ask the Holy Spirit to work in you, to help you to make decisions that are, that are following his way and not our way. Keep trusting him. You might be surprised at how good the fulfillment of God's promise is. So how long did they have to wait? That's a question that we might have. Uh, there's these 120 people, they're gathered, they're waiting, and it says that the Holy Spirit came upon them on Pentecost, which means, that's a Greek word for 50, okay, so remember that, Pentecost means 50, uh, so it's 50 days after the first fruits offering, 
and the first fruits offering was when Jesus w- was resurrected. That's the, the day uh, of, of when he was resurrected. So 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, Pentecost happens in the Jew- Jewish tradition. So let's do the math. Jesus rose from the dead, and how many days did we find out that he was on earth before he ascended to heaven? 40. Good job. So 40 days, and and Pentecost means 50, so like how many days did they have to wait? Say it. 10. Very good. You know math. So they had to wait 10 days. Now, 10 days doesn't seem like much, but when you're in, think about their situation, you know, what had just happened there. There was a lot of anticipation. They're probably trying to regret, well, he's probably going to come on the third day again, right? You know, I'm sure there was some, some of that going on. But 10 days later, he comes. So let's read the first 13 verses. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest upon each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Now, that's kind of a a little bit of derogatory because Galileans were considered to be uneducated, simple kind of hillbillies. Uh, So they were saying, these guys can speak other languages? Like, they're shocked. Then, how is it that each of us hears them in our native native language? Parthians, Medes, uh, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia. That sounds like a drink from Starbucks. Pontus in Asia, Pydria, Pamphylia, uh, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. So, there you go. So when you don't understand something, you blame the alcohol, right? So notice three things happen here. There's three phenomena that happen here. The first one is this. There's an audible sound like a violent wind. Did you catch that? It said that there there was this sound uh, like a violent wind. Now, wind is a symbol of the presence of God. If you read scripture, in the Old Testament especially, Uh, The word for wind in the Old Testament and the New Testament in Hebrew and Greek uh, are both synonymous with the word spirit. So when we're talking about wind, it's often referring to the spirit, and God's presence is represented in the wind. When Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind, like God took him in a whirlwind, the Lord spoke to Job in a whirlwind. Some of you guys are reading through the book of Job right now as you read through the Bible. There was a, a time where he spoke to him in the whirlwind. In Jeremiah 30, 23, it says, Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goes forth with fury. In the New Testament, remember that Jesus talking to Nicodemus? Nicodemus was one of the religious leaders, and he was talking about being born again and trying to help him to understand that. And in John 3, 8, he says, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Isn't that good? Just like the wind, that's how the Holy Spirit works. You don't always see it, but you know it's there. You know that he's working. Wind is powerful, and it can destroy or it can harness, be harnessed and generate power, produce energy. You can't see the wind, but you can hear it and you can feel it. It's the same with the Holy Spirit. So this sound was kind of a a sign that the the Holy Spirit is present. God is present. But it also got the attention of the people. Did you catch that? That they heard this sound, and they were like, what's going on? And they were attracted, like, something's happening here. And so they went to it. Now, I don't think there was an actual wind, like, blowing like a hurricane. It was just the sound. So all these people start gathering around, and then they start noticing that these, these men are talking 
in their language. They're praising God in their language. And so it was a way that that's how the Holy Spirit works. Remember we talked about last week that he, he draws people to him. The Holy Spirit's always at work. And he's drawing this huge crowd in to hear the gospel. We'll find out in a moment. So the second thing that happens, you have this, this audio, the, the, the hearing, but also the visual. It says what looked like tongues of fire that rested on them. Now, fire is also a symbol of God's presence. You know, this was, uh, this was not, I don't think it was an actual fire that would have burned their hair. You know, but it looked like that to, who, like to Luke who was observing this. And so God was present, like, again, some examples here. God was present with Moses' burning bush, right? Remember the burning bush story. You'll get to that as you read through the Old Testament. The Israelites in the wilderness, they were guided by a cloud by day and what? A pillar of fire by night. His guiding presence his fire, his guiding presence. You can see him in the fire. In Exodus 19, when God gives the Ten Commandments and the law to Moses up on Mount Sinai, it says he descended on the mountain with fire. The Israelites were down below and they were seeing this and they were like, they were afraid. In Matthew 3, 11, this is John the Baptist talking. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than, than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And in Hebrews 12, 29, it says that God is a, a consuming fire. So this fire uh, is representative, symbolic of God's presence. Again, fire is very powerful. But when it's harnessed and used in, in a good way like God, it, it, it creates incredible movement. And here it represents the power of God and the guidance of God. Now this was also uh, a way to visually show the disciples that God was present. You know, this is the coming of the Holy Spirit the first time he's empowering the church. He's empowering these 120 people to go out and start a movement that he had started. And the Holy Spirit should be vis visible to others in your life. When people look at you, they should be able to see God uh, doing work in and through your life. And this is a good representation of that. The third thing that happens is there's this verbal, people speaking in, in other tongues or languages. Uh, this third phenomenon was speaking in a language that the person speaking it didn't know, but that others could understand. The people listening could hear them praising God and praying to God in their native tongue. Now, this was a way to draw the people in. Again, the Holy Spirit working in, in, in uh, miraculous ways like this so that they would want to listen and know what's going on. Now, I don't have time to preach an entire message on speaking in tongues, but I do want to address some things here. Here at Grace Church, we believe that the Holy Spirit gives gifts, the spiritual gifts to people today, just like he did back then. You know, we would, uh, we would say that uh, we would not be cessationists, which means the, that the, the gifts have stopped, okay? So, so that, the Holy Spirit is still active, still powerful, working in and through people uh, to reach the world. I'm going to give you some scriptures here. You can write them down if you want to read more about uh, spiritual gifts, including speaking in tongues. Romans 12, 3 through 8. Romans 12, 3 through 8. 1 Corinthians can abbreviate that. I know it's a long. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11, and 27 through 31. 1 through 11, tw chapter 12, 1 through 11, 27 through 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. And then 1 Peter 4, 9 through 11. 1 Peter 4, 9 through 11. If you miss any of those, come up to me, see me afterwards, I'll give them to you. But one of, the, one of those gifts is speaking in tongues. And I believe this is primarily used as a, as, as a prayer to God or to praise God. It's when it's done in public, there's supposed to be interpretation. You know, Paul actually warns about uh, abusing this gift and other gifts, uh, making them more important than any other gift. So there's a lot written, in, in, especially in 1 Corinthians, about uh, the abuse of this. 
Now, we would also say here at Grace that we believe that every believer gets at least one spiritual gift. God is going to give you something to help build up the church. No one receives all the gifts. Only Jesus had all of the spiritual gifts. You know, we can't earn it. You, you, you don't earn a gift. It's a gift. The Holy Spirit decides what you get. That's another important distinction. Spiritual gifts are, are not for my benefit, but for others. It's not to make you look good. It's to make God look good. Does that make sense? No matter what the spiritual gift is. The Holy Spirit, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it says, The Holy Spirit displays God's power through each of us as a means of helping the entire church. So that's what spiritual gifts are for, including speaking in tongues. Now, speaking in tongues can be a powerful way to worship, connect with God, uh, to help you mature in your faith and to grow as a disciple. Uh, I don't speak in tongues, but I have friends that do. Okay, so uh, speaking in tongues is a, is a legitimate thing. It's a legitimate gift. Now, I, I don't believe that every believer can speak in tongues. Obviously, I just said that I don't. I don't think uh, every believer has the gift of mercy or prophecy. You know, speaking in tongues doesn't prove that you have the Holy Spirit. It doesn't make you more spiritual than someone who doesn't. So you, that's where you have to guard against any spiritual gift making you feel superior to anybody else. I also struggle to believe that you can teach a spiritual gift to someone. You can teach about them, but you, cannot, you should not be able to teach someone to speak in tongues. That, that would be a red flag for me, okay? The Holy Spirit can give you that ability to speak in tongues, to, to have a, a prayer language to the Lord, uh, but, I, but teaching someone to do it, that would be like teaching you know, like, we can teach about these gifts. All of us are, are called to do all of the spiritual gifts. Like, we're supposed to care for people, you know, uh, share the gospel, those kinds of things. But the Holy Spirit's the one that gives it to you. And so last week, we learned that you ask. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal what your spiritual gift is. If you're struggling to understand what that might be, you know, he'll reveal it to you. Other people will confirm it in you. So ask the Holy Spirit to confirm that. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, if you have questions, I'd be glad to talk more about that. So why did God choose the Feast of Pentecost as the, the, the day to pour out the Holy Spirit? Well, the short answer is that God has been unveiling his plan to the world in chronological order through the ancient Jewish feasts. You read the Old Testament, you're gonna be re a lot of you are reading through it, you're going to read about all these feasts or festivals that, that happened. So I want to give you a couple of them here. The Jewish calendar, it's in your notes there. The Feast of Passover is the first one. This is when Jesus was arrested and crucified. Remember, they were having the Passover meal together in the upper room. This is uh, celebrating when the death angel passed over the, uh, their ancestors in Egypt before they left. They, had, they killed a lamb, put the blood over their, their doorpost, and the, the angel passed over them, didn't kill anybody in the household. This was the Passover meal where we now have the Lord's Supper. And during the Passover meal, Jesus was crucified. And the final, he was the final atoning sacrifice for our sins. We talked about that quite a bit last week as well. So Jesus dies on the cross, paying the price for our sin. And then on the third day, he rises again. He comes back to life. On that third day, that was what they called the first fruits. And what, what they did at first fruits was they would give uh, a sacrifice. They would bring their first fruits to the temple as a way of saying, hey, this is harvest season, and we're, we're beginning towards Pentecost. It was the countdown to Pentecost. Okay, so that happened on the, the resurrection day. So we begin this countdown to Pentecost. Uh, so that was the beginning. Jesus rises from the dead on the first fruits, in effect saying that he's the first to be resurrected, and there'll be many after him to follow uh, in that same way. When we're, we're believing him, we are resurrected. So he, he dies on Passover, he rises on first fruits, and then the feast of the Jewish, the next feast is Pentecost. Okay, I remember I said 50. So the Pentecost is also known as the Feast of Weeks because it was seven weeks after first fruits. Okay, seven weeks plus one day is how they described it in the Old Testament. So uh, that's the day of Pentecost. And I'll say more about that in just a moment, but uh, 
what's the next feast after Pentecost? You probably don't know because you're not Jewish scholars, right? You're not Jewish. But it's the Feast of Trumpets. I thought this was so interesting when I was talking about it. I'm just going to share it real quick. It's also known as Rosh Hashanah. You may have heard that and maybe seen it on a calendar. That's the new year for the Jewish nation. So what happens next after, in our, in our talking about Jesus, what happens next? You know, he was resurrected. The Holy Spirit comes on Pentecost. Jesus is coming back next, right? We're in the church age. And we're, we're in this age until he comes back. So the next feast is, is this feast of trumpets. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven, just like he went up, with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So as I was looking at this, do you think it would be possible that he might come back during the feast of trumpets? I think maybe. So the next question you have is, so when is the Feast of Trumpets? I looked it up. This year it begins at sundown of October the 2nd through uh, sundown of October the 4th. It's, a, it's about two and a half days or so. That's when they're going to celebrate Rosh Hashanah. Now, I know that the Bible says that no man will know the day or time, and I completely agree with that, but... This kind of makes sense in the chronological order of how God is revealing things. So every October 2nd, from now on, we're all going to be looking up. Like, clear your calendar. Like, make sure you're good with God. <laughs> now, I'm not saying he's coming back this year on October 2nd. Please don't go say, well, Chad said. No, 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 no. I'm just saying that it, it's interesting how that works. And I believe it could be one of these years. It could be around that time. So. A little historical background on the Pentecost is seven weeks after the first fruits. Now, there was a couple of reasons that they would celebrate Pentecost. I want to give those to you. The first one, when they celebrate Pentecost, it was to commemorate the giving of the law to Moses. So when he was on Mount Sinai with the stone tablets, it was to commemorate and remember him getting the law. So they would have read those stories to, to their kids. They would have commemorated that. Uh, but there was also something that happened uh, after he got the law. So he was up there, for, it says, for 40 days and 40 nights. You can read about this in Exodus chapter 24 through 32. It's a pretty big section uh, of Scripture where he goes up on the mountain. He's up there so long that the people get restless. They don't like to wait. They, they're like, well, is he going to come back? Where is he? What's going on? We don't know wh wh what to do. So what do they do? Well, they started to say, hey, we need to, some, somebody to worship. So Aaron, you know, why don't you make us some gods so that we can worship uh, the gods or God or whatever. And he said, okay, give me all your gold earrings and all your gold jewelry and let's meld it together. So he melts all this gold and he forms a, a calf out of this gold and they start to worship this calf. Okay, so this is what's going on at the bottom of the mountain. God tells Moses, your people are down there doing some really bad things. And God says, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to take them all out, and we're going to start over. Moses pleads for God not to do that. Convinces God, if you can convince God, uh, that he was, was not going to wipe them out. So Moses goes down. That's when he throws the stone tablets down and destroys them. Later on, he goes back up and gets another set. And 3,000 people were killed that day. So they're commemorating the law coming and remembering that people died. So the law brings death. I want you to remember that. The law brings death. Okay, so keep that in mind. We're going to go back to Acts chapter 2. So now Pentecost comes. So you're remembering what, what, why they're celebrating. Pentecost comes. And what happens next? Peter gets up and starts to preach. So all these people are hearing their people talking in their languages, and they're like, hey, what's going on? Peter gets up and starts to preach. Peter that had failed miserably, had been redeemed by Jesus, and now is filled with the Holy Spirit. 
This is what happened, Acts 2, 14 through 16. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. <laughs> I love that. Um, no, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. He goes on to preach a message using the prophet Joel and King David to, to let them know who Jesus is. He says, this is like our scriptures pointed to Jesus. This is who he is. And he, he reminded them of what just happened. That he, he was the sacrifice for our sins. And so he shares the gospel very clearly in language they would have understood who Jesus was. This is how they responded. Let's jump down to verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized. That should be your response. When you understand who Jesus is, you should repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And here it is. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So last week we talked about when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're given the Holy Spirit is in you. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So the Old, Old Testament Pentecost was giving of the law that leads to death, but the New Testament Pentecost was the giving of the Holy Spirit that leads to life. 3,000 were saved. Old Testament, 3,000 died. I don't think that's a coincidence. I believe God is, is very clear here that the new covenant is bringing life. The old law, the Old Testament, was never intended to save us. It was intended to expose our sinful condition. That's what the laws did. That's what the Ten Commandments do. It lets us know that we need a Savior. Now, the law is kind of like a thermometer. can't make you well, but it can let you know if you have a fever, if that's easier to understand. But we can never be good enough. We all need a Savior. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I have come to, to give life and have it to the full. He wants us to have an abundant life. He wants us to have eternal life. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. So the law kills and the spirit gives life. The second reason that they celebrated was because of the wheat harvest. It was the end of the wheat harvest. There's seven weeks now, it's the end of the harvest. Leviticus 23 tells us what it is. Count off 50 days up until the day after the seventh Sabbath and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. From wherever you live, bring two loaves made with two uh, tenths of an ephah of the finest flour, baked with yeast, that's important, as a wave offering before first fruits of the Lord. Now that was unusual because usually they didn't want, God didn't want you to use yeast in your bread, right? You know, you would, during Passover you were supposed to get rid of all the yeast in your house because yeast represents sin, okay? When you put yeast in dough, what happens? You knead it and it goes throughout the whole dough and it makes everything grow and grow and grow, just like sin. You let sin into your life, and it gets into you, and it just starts to grow and grow and grow. So you want to get rid of the sin. That, that's, but here he's saying, put the yeast in. So why would he do that? Well, I think one of the reasons is because um, he's, what he's doing here, there's two loaves, okay? So they, they, would, they would take these two loaves, and they would wave them in front of the Lord, okay? I think he was preparing us to say, Hey, one loaf is the Jews and one's the Gentiles. They all have sin. And we're being presented to the Lord. And the Holy Spirit takes away the sin and accepts us even though we're sinful. Sorry, I'm skipping some things here. In Acts 2, we see a large harvest of 3,000 people. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 9. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. You know, kind of, I see the, the world like a big uh, wheat field. 
And that every grain in that wheat field represents a person. And every person needs Jesus. That's what, what is represented here. All of us, when we're, we're brought to, to Jesus, he's willing to take away our sins. Last week, we gave you a, a card that was the cause circle. If you didn't get one of those, I believe there's still some out on the, the desk out there. Uh, grab one of those because we want you to start thinking about who are some people in your life that you can start praying for. The, the care circle is prayer, care, and share. People that you can pray for, that you can care for, build a relationship with, and share the gospel. Invite them to church, those kind of things. All of us play a part in this harvest. We're the workers. That's why the church started all those years ago, was to spread the good news about Jesus and help people to understand. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. That's why he empowers us and gives us spiritual gifts so that we can share the gospel so more people can come into the family. Here's your takeaway for the day. As a believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you. However, you also have access to the power of the Holy Spirit to come on you, to empower you, to live an abundant life and help the church spread the gospel to the world around us. So if you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you, but we also have to tap into the power that comes with that to make a difference in the world around us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pause here and we know that um, you're at work in us, in the church. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand uh, some of these uh, Old Testament principles and the tie-in to uh, you coming that uh, your Holy Spirit being given on Pentecost is a way of uh, bringing in this new covenant that represents life, where the old covenant represented death and reminded us of, of how much we need a Savior. So I pray, Lord, that we would continue to grow in our relationship with you. If there's anyone that doesn't have a relationship with you, today could be that day of starting that relationship, of asking you to forgive them of their sins, asking uh, for, for your Holy Spirit to fill them up, to be a part of their life, to, to cover over their sins, to be a part of God's family. Lord, for all of us that are in God's family, help us to be a part of what you're doing, of sharing the gospel, of spreading the good news about Jesus. Everyone needs Jesus. We know that your Holy Spirit is drawing people, that, that is doing work that we can't see, Lord, help us to trust you. Bring names to our mind, that, that people that we can pray for, that we can connect with, that we can encourage. Lord, help us to really make a difference in the world around us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.